Hey, everybody. Welcome to Daniel Davis Deep Dive, coming to you live from Washington, D.C. again. And as always, we got a great show for you today. We have the ever popular Douglas McGregor back. Uh, Doug McGregor is, of course, a, a highly decorated combat veteran, author of five books, uh, CEO of Our Country, Our Choice, and friend of the show. Welcome back, Doug. You're, you're wearing a relic of the past, a tanker's <laughs> jacket. I'm sure all of those things are banned now, aren't they? Well, they, they aren't on our show, so I don't go out of the room with it. But uh, but yeah, I kind of wear that as a badge of honor. Yeah, it's good to see that. Everybody used to wear their qualification badges on that thing. I don't know. Yeah, if they yeah, that's or not back when they qualified. But uh, right. I don't know if we have time for that with all these uh, trainings and everything going on these days. But uh, well, that's another issue. <laughs> uh, Boy, you know, we got some some really important things to discuss here today uh, with with the, the war that's going on in, in uh, of course, still in, in Russia and in, in between Russia and Ukraine. Now then the war going on down in, in south between Israel and Hamas and the possibility of exploding into a regional fight. There's so many things to discuss here, but I want to narrow in on something that's uh, really kind of been in the news a lot in the last week or so, and that I don't think a lot of people have a lot of knowledge and understanding of. And, and I want to do a deep dive on that. And there's nobody better at this than Doug McGregor. Uh, so I want to discuss some of the issues that people need to know about uh, Turkey, because some things I think are worse than they look, but some things I think aren't as bad as they look. And I want to try to uh, isolate that out. And so we have a, an accurate view of it. Uh, first thing I want to pop up here, just kind of set the stage is a, is a report uh, from this morning when uh, our, our secretary of state Blinken went to Turkey uh, on, on a tour throughout the Middle East. Uh, and here's what they reported. Very interesting thing here. It seems as though uh, both Turkey and the U.S. positions are quite far apart. Relations between Turkey and Israel are clearly broken down. What can Antony Blinken hope to achieve with this? Indeed, Turkish and Americans' positions are more and more divergent. So just in minutes, we're expecting the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to arrive in the building, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, right behind me. And the meeting is expected to start in minutes with his Turkish counterpart. But yes, the positions of the both countries are extremely different. But there is another side of story today that's happening in, in, in, in, in Ankara today. So... It is the cold treatment from Turks toward the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Just after midnight, he has landed in Ankara, and there was not any uh, high-level Turkish diplomat receiving him at the airport. And today, we have been informed that there's not going to be a joint presser after the meeting. And there is not going to be a meeting between President Erdogan and Antony Blinken as well. So all of these are telling us something. Telling us something. I think one of the first things it's telling us is that the United States has a real problem with its diplomatic power, because this is kind of a repeat of what happened with uh, Mohammed bin Salman in, in Saudi Arabia uh, a couple of weeks ago when Blinken went there and he was made to wait for like many hours because bin Salman was was busy, didn't want to bother with him. And the dis, the, really the disregard that he showed for, for Blinken, therefore, the United States is is on display a lot here. And we're starting to see that more often that our senior officials uh, are uh, viewed with almost contempt by even some of our allies. As you know, uh, Turkey has been on a path that diverges pretty sharply from the West for at least the last 20 years, maybe longer. <clears throat> Mr. Erdogan has simply made something clear uh, to everyone that may not have understood it in the past. And that is that Turkey is an Islamic state and he has restored Islam's central position in Turkish society. That brand of Islam is Sunni Islam with a Turkish flavor. And remember that uh, Mr. Erdogan is the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, not only in the region, but also in the United States and Canada. So he's very, very prominent, particularly in Hamas circles, because Hamas is ultimately, you might say, an armed wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. So everyone turns constantly towards Iran, pointing the finger, blaming them for whatever is wrong with Hamas. But in truth, uh, the Turks are probably closer to Hamas in their thinking and attitudes, certainly towards Israel and the world, than they are to uh, Iran. And I think that's an important point that everybody misses. Yeah. The, the Turkish foreign minister was the one who met with him, but he 
Mr. Blinken was not met at the airport by anyone of significance. It was almost treated as a routine visit when in fact it's obviously not. When he did finally get to the Capitol, he met only with uh, the foreign minister, whereas the Iranian foreign minister, when he visited, was received by all of the leading officials. And then after he met with the Turkish foreign minister, was able to go and meet with Mr. Erdogan. Erdogan. So I think the, the contrast is profound. I, I hope everybody noticed that. And, and you, I, I, I bet no one in the United States noticed this unless they're watching Deep Dive here, which is why we're so grateful to have you on here. But I do you suspect, I, I'm probably a rhetorical question, but the people in the region are noticing those two contradictions. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> There's no question about it. And Mr. Blinken has spent most of his time talking to Arab states that, let's be frank, uh, they have power in their own right in various areas, but they're no match militarily for Israel and the United States. Uh, Egypt, for instance, which has tried very hard to maintain good relations with Israel over the last, what, 50 years, frankly, uh, has no desire to go to war with Israel, but it's in a tough position given the uh, treatment being meted out to the Arabs in Gaza. The same thing is true in Jordan, I think, also Saudi Arabia, the Emirates. But that doesn't mean that they are forgiving towards us or the Israelis for what is happening. It's just that there's probably not a great deal that they alone can do about it. And I think that's an important point. There is someone who can <clears throat> have a profound impact militarily, and that is Mr. Erdogan. And everybody knows that you're talking about the largest army <clears throat> in NATO, probably the largest air force after our own, and conceivably one of the largest navies in the world. And that's not all. I mean, Mr. Erdogan currently maintains what is reportedly the largest drone fleet uh, in the mm. world, that is, air, air, unmanned aerial vehicles. <clears throat> and they have made a lot of progress. They build a lot of their own equipment. It's very good equipment. They have a huge manpower pool, over 2 million reservists that can be rapidly mobilized if necessary. And, and anyone who bothers to look at the televised uh, demonstrations can conclude very rapidly that this public is very firmly behind Mr. Erdogan on this and, question. And in fact, that's a, that's a point I wanted to make out here. We have uh, a, a small piece of a clip here, which brings out a couple of important points. And then we're going to follow that up with something Erdogan specifically said. And I want to help you. I want you to help us interpret that. First of all, Gary, show that first clip there. At a mass rally in Istanbul Saturday, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan stepped up his support of Hamas, declaring again that Hamas is not a terrorist organization, but a liberation movement. The Turkish leader went on to warn that Turkey may come in the night to Gaza, with the crowd chanting to send the Turkish military. In response to Erdogan's statements, Israel has recalled its diplomats from Turkey, setting back the country's newly restored diplomatic relations. So this isn't something that's happening in the dark. I mean, there's, there was over a million people standing there, uh, you know, at that rally. And he's Erdogan is absolutely out in the front, not afraid of what anybody has to think about it. And I think one of the more concerning issues, but especially in light of what you just said about their military power, he said this. Ya Israel, sen buralara nasıl geldin? Nasıl girdin? Sen bir işgalcisin. Sen bir örgütsün. Dolayısıyla Türk milleti bunu biliyor. İsrail. Biz de seni savaş suçlusu olarak dünyaya ilan edeceğiz. Gazze'de savunma değil. Açık ve alçak bir katliam yürütülmektedir. So the question is how much of that is playing to the crowd for the domestic folks how much of it is it an international message and what is actually the message he's trying to send and bottom line is what is the risk that they could actually make good on that with that military against israel well one of the things that he's also said that is hardly being covered in the west is that uh, turkish soldiers will eventually fight in gaza so i don't think you can be much more straightforward than that but mr erdogan is is nothing if not clever and he's very sensitive to timing. And what you saw in that rally and what you've seen in subsequent presentations and speeches is an effort to mobilize the country. Now, he would not make this effort if he thought this war would be over quickly, 
that Israel would simply cease and desist and embrace a ceasefire. He's actually preparing the nation for action. Now, when will that action occur? Well, he's certainly not going to tell anybody. But I'm quite certain, that it, particularly in view of the recent celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Republic, where he paraded 100 uh, naval combatants through the Bosporus in front of the world and has made it very clear over and over and over again that he has great confidence in the military power at his disposal, it's, it's going to happen. The question is timing. And I would argue the same thing is probably true for Iran, although I think Iran is far more reluctant to become involved because Iran fears us and what it can do to its infrastructure, which is ultimately more fragile than Turkey's. Right. But still, <clears throat> he's quite serious, and it would be a mistake to dismiss him. I, I listened to someone quite recently in Washington who told me, oh, he's a blowhard. He said these things before. Nothing's going to happen. Well, good luck with that approach. I think it would be prudent to take him very, very seriously and understand that he's the one man in the region, the one leader with the capability to destroy Israel. Yeah, I think that's the key. He has the capacity, whereas Iran doesn't have the capacity. They can hurt Israel. They can't destroy it. But Turkey ha have a real chance for that. You know, one other quick point. People forget that from the Turkish standpoint, when he talks about the occupier, remember who was in Palestine for hundreds of years the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, who mm. controlled Syria, who controlled the Levant, who controlled most of the Arab world in the Middle East. It was the Turkish Empire. So from his vantage point, you could argue that uh, the Israeli Jews are standing on soil that he privately regards as, as not only Ottoman, but also permanently Islamic. And remember, they have this doctrine that says, once you're Islamic, it can never change. Uh, so you put all of these things together, and it would be a mistake not to take him seriously. Now, and then that, that leads to the next point here, unfortunately, is that I don't know that we have the diplomatic capacity to take him seriously. And, and let me just show you a couple of things here, uh, here recently that kind of illustrates that is, first of all, just a few days ago, uh, in, in terms of what the United States can do and how, how much influence they have over even our allies, John Kirby I uh, had this to say. Does the United States support the goal of destroying Hamas? We support what Israel is trying to do to protect their citizens from the threat of Hamas. And James, I think you know this, we aren't on the ground fighting in this war. There's no uh, intent to do that. This is, is, these are Israeli military operations. They get to decide what their aims and strategy are. They get to decide what their tactics are. They get to decide how they're going to go after Hamas. We're doing everything we can to support them, including providing our perspectives, including asking them hard questions about their aims and their strategy and uh, the kind of questions we'd ask ourselves. But the question you ask me is a question better put to the Israeli Defense Forces. So we don't have much influence even over Israel. They've hardly listened to us anything. And Biden has been really trying to get not a ceasefire because Netanyahu's disregarded that, but at least a humanitarian pause. But then you saw, uh, I guess it was yesterday, before Blinken went to Turkey, he was in Baghdad. And when he was asked about the success of that, he said this. President Joe Biden, when asked whether he was optimistic, he felt progress was being made towards getting Israel to agree to humanitarian policies and strikes. He gave a thumbs up and said yes. Based on your conversations with Israel on Friday, with Arab leaders and yesterday and today, do you share the president's optimism? This is a process. Israel's raised important questions about uh, how humanitarian pauses would work. We've got to answer those questions. We're working on exactly that. In fact, we agreed that our uh, teams would get together and they're doing just that, uh, including today, to work through the specifics, the practicalities of, um, of these pauses. And just to show you how little impact that had, here is how Netanyahu talked after he met with Blinken. So you had Blinken there saying that his signature success was that they had a group of people to talk. And then you saw afterwards Netanyahu just say, hey, this is to our enemies and our friends. We ain't doing any of that. We're going to do whatever we feel like doing. So if we don't have influence 
with our allies or potentially with uh, Turkey either. How much control do we have over how this situation evolves at all? Uh, two quick points. <clears throat> First, it was nice that uh, the Secretary of State took off his body armor uh, when he decided to hold this press conference. Uh, I don't know that very many Americans saw it, but he wore body armor during his visit to Baghdad. Now, we've tried to create the fiction that we achieved something positive for ourselves as well as for the Arabs in Iraq. But if the American Secretary of State is at such risk that he has to wear body armor in Baghdad, uh, I think it puts the end to uh, that lie. Uh, it's also a disgrace that our Secretary of State would, under any circumstances, be under that kind of threat anywhere in the world. Secondly, uh, Mr. Biden and his administration is obedient uh, in service to Israel. And this obedience and their unconditional support for whatever the Israelis want has led to something very dangerous. Effectively, what Biden has done, and, and I think really Biden is a, sort of an afterthought, I think it's Blinken and Sullivan and their, their powerful forces behind them, have essentially opened the cage door and let the tiger out. The tiger is called Netanyahu. And the tiger has determined that it must devour everyone and anyone in the neighborhood that it dislikes or considers a threat. We don't know what to do about that. And the reason we don't know what to do about it is that everyone in this government, in Washington in general, lives in fear of the Israel lobby, in fear of what could be done to them here politically if they stand up and say, well, enough's enough. There are limits to our support. There are limits to our tolerance. You know, if, if Richard Nixon were the president, Eisenhower were the president, I think even someone like uh, LBJ, probably Carter, uh, ultimately would have stood up and said, either you stop what you are doing right now, or we will withdraw our forces, i.e., we'll simply withdraw the naval power in the region. That would ultimately get Mr. Netanyahu's attention. But the Israeli influence and Mr. Netanyahu's personal power and authority at this point is so great that everyone is afraid to contradict him. And so it really doesn't matter what Mr. Blinken says in public. The truth is Mr. Netanyahu is in control. He's not only in control of his destiny, he controls the destiny of American national power, prestige, and influence in the region. Is there is there anyone that that is willing to stand up and just say, hey, it's not anti-Israel to talk about taking care of American national security interest, American interest, economic interest even, or all the things you just mentioned. Do you see anybody, I don't care what party, that's willing to stand up and say, hey, look, we like Israel, but we love America, and, and here's what we need to do toward that end to help both. Well, I think John Mearsheimer has tried to do just that. And of course, in many of the uh, more extreme circles in, inside the Israel lobby, he's regarded as a self-loathing Jew. And uh, frankly, you're going to be tarnished almost immediately as not just anti-Israeli per se, but as an anti-Semite. I, look, this is, a, this is a tough position, but I've taken the position from the very beginning that we would have to intervene to save Israel from itself. My assumption from the very beginning was that this could actually escalate to a regional conflict. I think the Israeli attitude has been as long as we are there and our power can be leveraged on their behalf, they can simply go on with this war of annihilation against Gaza and Hamas until they're finished, and no one will interfere because we are there, at least in the background, ready to support them. That puts us in the uncomfortable position of supporting something we say we oppose. Some of you may remember that we attacked the Serbs, in my judgment, on shaky grounds, frankly, but we said that the Serbs were guilty of ethnic cleansing, of driving out the Albanians. In truth, none of the Albanians were driven out until we started to bomb. But the point is, we have always taken a position that that's unacceptable. But we've decided now this is acceptable if the Israelis do it. Now, in fairness to the Israelis, and they do deserve to hear this, when Mr. Begin and uh, Mr. Sadat, or President Sadat, met uh, during the you know, Camp David Accords discussions, Menachem Begin actually offered Gaza to uh, Anwar Sadat and said, look, we'll give it to you. You take it over. 
you maintain order and control, and Sadat refused. Flat out, not on your life, out of the question. Well, they still reached an agreement. But the point then and the point now is the same. No one in the Muslim world wants vast numbers of Palestinians streaming into their country. Now, they have various reasons for that. They, they, they think their societies are fragile. The sudden arrival of these people could be disruptive and destabilizing. Of course, I feel the same way about my country and illegal immigration that is right now sanctioned by the administration. They don't seem to care about our borders and who comes in. But at the same time, there's something else here, and that is the fear in the Arab world that if the Palestinians simply left or were relocated at great expense, but done so peaceably, that that would end the discussion about Israel's legitimacy and yeah. its long-term position in the region. The and Palestinians, there would be no more two-state solution. That wouldn't even be a fantasy. It would right. just be eliminated. And, you know, the Palestinians have been useful instruments in the Arab world with which to beat the Israelis over the head about this sort of thing. No one has had a solution. Now there is a solution. It's Mr. Netanyahu's solution. And his goal, and the goal of the people that support him, is to essentially cleanse the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. This is just the first big bite. And I think in their minds, they believe that if they can succeed in Gaza, annihilate the Hamas, destroy Gaza, drive out the people that live there, this will be an object lesson. And it will be much easier to induce the people on the West Bank to get out, thereby creating what they think is the biblical Israel. In other words, the, the pre-modern Israel. Now, that's yeah. another point of debate. So, so let me ask you this, though. From a military perspective, is it even a viable military task? Or, or, well, is it a political task to give the military to, say, destroy Hamas and bring peace to Israel? Can you... I don't even, can you even physically kill all Hamas without killing all the people and have peace the result at the end of that? Well, the, in Warsaw, uh, in uh, January of 1945, uh, I, I think that's about right, uh, the Nazis uh, went in and crushed the Warsaw Uprising by the Poles. And the Poles were very stupid. All they had to do was wait for a few months, and the Soviets would have been there and then they might have had a chance at defending themselves against the Soviets. Instead, they decided to fight the Germans who were ultimately on the way out, and the Germans annihilated them. So do I think it could be done? Yes, the IDF could do to Gaza what was done to Warsaw. And the population there could be dramatically reduced, perhaps not entirely killed or destroyed, but certainly substantially reduced and driven out. That is attainable. The point again is... Who are the key actors in all of this? What if Mr. Erdogan finally says, that's it? You know, you've crossed the Rubicon. You're, you're over right. the line. We are now going to act. We are obligated as Muslims to act against you. And in the meantime, he receives assurances from the Saudis and the Emirates. We will support you because remember, his economy is not especially robust. It needs support. He gets a lot of money from Qatar. If he's promised enough funding from all of the actors in the region, the key ones like Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, then he can move. At the same time, he is probably going to turn around to Iran and say, are you going to join me in this? And I Whoa. think the Turks attack, the Iranians probably will. It's not because they want to, but they'll see that there's really no alternative. This is the problem from the very beginning for Israel. Israel's enemies continue to multiply. And we don't that, even. That, that's actually the issue. This is this is not, too many people view of any question about what we're doing to support Israel as being anti-Israel. And I argue that the things you're talking about right here is the best thing for Israel. This is the best chance to actually protect them by reining in their worst impulses. Because if you actually could bring the a Sunni Muslim and a and a, and a Shia Muslim country together in opposition to Israel. I mean, that that's almost mind-blowing that that's even possible. Well, remember that uh, the conventional wisdom says I'm wrong. You know, conventional wisdom inside the belt is, oh, forget that. That's not going to happen. Nothing like that will happen. This will just uh, slimmer, simmer down and quiet down, and eventually this will go away. But, but listen carefully to Mr. Netanyahu's words. Everybody listen to... Uh, the Shiite leader on uh, yeah, Friday. Right. Listen to what Mr. Erdogan said in that, or Mr. Netanyahu said in that recent interview that you flashed across the screen. 
He said, we have no alternative. Either we do this or we're, we're in trouble. In other words, for him, this is an existential fight. He views the, the enemy as not really being in an existential fight. There are more Arabs out there. And in, in, in inexhaustible numbers of Muslim Arabs in his judgment. And what he's trying to do is tell all the rest of the world, listen, you you take care of yourselves. We won't bother you, but we're going to finish this job come hell or high water. And we're supposed to support this. Well, the rest of the world isn't just staying out of it. The rest of the world is watching it. The rest of the world is appalled. Even when you go into Europe, everyone thinks that, well, the Europeans are all behind Israel. Well, the elites in the government are, are supportive of Israel. Yeah. But when you dig deeper into the populations of Western Europe, they're no more supportive of Israel than they are of the Islamist Arabs. They would like the Muslims out of their country, but that doesn't mean they support Israel. And, and, and look, they, they've been having, I mean, you're talking about Paris, Berlin, uh, several European nations, large scale pro-Palestinian ergo indirectly against the Israeli position of killing so many innocent Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, I, I think that's having a huge negative impact on Israel because they keep saying with words, oh, we're using targeted strikes and we're really trying to take care of people. And you see with your eyes, they're, they're not even making an attempt, it doesn't look like to me. But you know from your own experience, this notion that you can put soldiers on the ground and carefully pick and choose. Oh, yes, I see that person over there is friendly. We'll move our fire to the right here because that one, that's got to be a Hamas fighter. Give me a break. I, you know, I, I am the last person to criticize Israeli soldiers for whatever they do in that city, because they want to stay alive. It's fine right. to defeat the enemy, but to defeat the enemy, you need to kill the enemy before he kills you. That means the notion that can be, what do they call it? Discretionary warfare. I always laugh when I hear this sort of thing. So when somebody asks me, can the Israelis go in there and utterly annihilate the place? Yes, they can do that. It's going to take time and it's going to cost a lot of lives. The question is, how long will this go on before finally someone somewhere in Ankara, in Tehran, in Riyadh, in Cairo says, oh my God, no more. This has to end. And if the United States won't intervene, then we will have to do so. That's the question. Yeah, and that is my big, big concern. And, and that's why, going back to the beginning of this, I worry about who we've got operating here. That's President Biden at the top and, and Blinken as the, as the senior guy from the State Department, because you see that he's just being held in contempt by everybody on, on both our enemies and our friends. He's just viewed with nearly contempt and certainly not having any influence by any of them. And if that's what's going to keep us out of war, then we have some real trouble. But I, I think, Doug, that th what what needs to happen is there, there needs to be some strings put on this funding right real quick. And I don't know if Congress can do it, if if the White House won't, but somebody needs to say, hey, all this $14 billion that you're you're wanting here, that's going to be putting some big strings on there because we're not going to harm, we're not basically going to pay to harm our own interests, which is what we seem to be doing right now. Well, right now you have too many people like uh, Senators Blumenthal, and Graham, who are anxious to go to war with Iran and want to use this particular opportunity to do so. So they're doing the opposite of what you're suggesting. They're passing a bill effectively conferring authority on the president to attack at, uh, Iran if he deems it appropriate based upon whatever they whatever the Iranians allegedly do. You know, this is scary stuff that harkens back to something like the Gulf of Tonkin. We don't want to do that, but there are a lot of people on the Hill that feel that way. And then you have the people on the Hill who are just afraid of the money. The money, not so much that can be deprived, uh, they can be deprived of, but the money that can go to their opponents in the future from the lobby because right. they, they made a decision the lobby didn't like. You know, if you're waiting for men of courage and conviction to stand up and be counted, boy, you're in for a long wait. Uh, it just really used to say that the most uh, rare uh, virtue in politics that he'd ever encountered was courage. He said you never see it because it, it's unrewarding. That's not how you stay in power. That's power, not how you yeah. get reelected. So I, I wouldn't expect that. So, And the other thing is, look, if you're going to get courage, it should be in the White House. But I don't see any evidence uh, for it. And I think someone like Mr. Netanyahu would eat these people for lunch. He is a tough-minded character. By the way, so is Erdogan. 
Erdogan's not going to be pushed easily in any particular direction. So I don't think we have either the personalities or the credibility right now or the strength to do much. Uh, yeah, we're, and, and, we're we're about running out of time here, but I, I do want to get one more one more uh, view on yours because it's something that that a lot of people have some strong opinions in opposite directions on. Uh, I have been on a number of uh, shows here recently where I've been ad advocating that we get our troops in Iraq and in Syria out because all they are is vulnerability for these you know Iraq Islamic bleh, Iranian backed groups that could kill Americans who were there for no value to our country, which could be used by people like Lindsey Graham to say, ah, see, now we have to strike Iran. And because they did it, even they wouldn't even be bothered or waiting for evidence. But the question that, that I'd like you to answer is, can it be done now? It should have been done a long time ago. It wasn't. Trump tried to get us out in, in 2019 out of Syria, and that was thwarted for reasons you know probably better than I do. But now then that we are here and, and they have been attacked recently, can we withdraw them without it harming our interest? Uh, and, and how would you how would you like to see that play out? Well, if you tried to withdraw those troops now by pointing out that the thousand up in Syria are essentially a target array waiting to be destroyed, whether it, it results from the Shiite militias or it results from the Turks as they move south to engage Israel. I mean, all sorts of bad possibilities exist. People would argue you can't do that. If you do that, you will signal weakness on the part of the United States. The same thing is true in Iraq. You know, if you pull them out of Iraq, it's the final admission that what we did there was an enormous failure. Remember, the Iraqi parliament voted to throw us out in, in, in uh, 2090, or excuse me, 2020. And uh, we politely said, no, we're not leaving. Doesn't matter what the Iraqi parliament says, we're staying. Uh, that was a mistake in my view. I think we should have said, fine, thank you very much, yeah. cut our losses and gotten out. We should have gotten out, the, gotten those troops in Syria out a long time ago. And frankly, when I was in the building and I asked the question, what are they doing? You know, you got various, said, well, they're there to help contain Iran. Really? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. I see no, no imminent Iranian invasion. Well, you know, the Shiite militias, yeah, well, they're all local. Uh, they're going to defend their turf, but I don't see any evidence for much else. Well, we have to be there for Israel. And, you know, my experience with the Israelis at the time was that if they, if somebody went, moved the wrong way, said the wrong thing, did anything in Syria, they'd know about it, didn't need our help. Didn't and, need uh, our help, right. And the Russians at that point, when they were accommodating the Israelis, made it possible for the Israelis to strike whatever Iranian-related targets they found in Syria that they thought were dangerous. Well, they destroyed their relationship with Russia. That's over, which is another subject, which is also, in my judgment, dangerous for Israel. They were, they actually were very smart diplomatically in the way they were handling Russia and the United States. So now they've got one friend left, really, who counts, and that's us. And we don't seem to be able to do what I think a friend should do, yeah. which is tell them, you know, this far and no further. I, I just don't think we can do it. So I see nothing happening until Mr. Netanyahu decides to make it happen. And then secondly, until this winds in some, into a somewhat more dangerous regional conflict. That's that's exactly what I fear the most. And Doug, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. I'm so grateful. This has been one of the most enlightening shows that we've ever done here. It's uh, really, really good. And I fear that there's much more to come and we'll have to have you back to go in probably what's going to be the next phase of this. Thank well, you for coming let's today. we're all wrong, you know, and uh, something else happens that keeps us out of this major war that will only result in Israel's destruction. That's what we don't want. That's exactly right. Thank you very much, Doug, and, and thank you guys for coming. Be sure and share this to everybody you can. You, you can tell just from having what you've heard here is that this is information that many Americans will never get if they don't get it on Deep Dive here. Uh, and we ask you to share this with your friends, like and subscribe, and we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.